So officially, good morning. A um, couple of you came up this morning and said, we're so excited to start the rest series. Um, that's next week. This week, we actually have a lot of stuff to get through. So are you ready for this? Wow. The, the good morning was way better than the yes. You ready? Yeah. All right, there it is. Buckle up, because we got a lot to chew through today from God's word. But let me start with this. For the last few weeks, Pastor Mark has been talking with us, maybe you recognize this, maybe you didn't, but about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's kind of an interesting thing, in fact, that Jesus, the Gospels tell us that Jesus begins calling his disciples, at least on a couple of occasions, by simply saying, follow me. Have you ever thought about that? How crazy that, in fact, is that Jesus, with two very simple words, initiates the power of God in the person's life that they can respond and say, all right. So Jesus says, follow me to his disciples, and they go, all right. And they get up and they start to follow him. And then they spend the next three and a half years trying to figure out what following him actually means. What does it look like? What flavor does it have? In baptism, God doesn't say directly to us, follow me, but he does take his name, his promise, and he unites it with water and applies it to us and in essence says, follow me. And some of us for a few months, and some of us for a few years, and a couple of us for a couple of decades have been trying to figure out, okay, Lord, I, I'm there because your spirit has enabled me to respond to that. However, I don't really know what following you means. Do you ever feel that way? But, I, but I'm, I'm working on it. I'm trying to figure it out. The disciples took three and a half years. I'm taking a little bit longer. But I want to learn what it means to follow you. And that's kind of what we've been chewing on. Today we're going to wrap that up as we head into our rest series next weekend. Which, by the way, little sidebar, I'm so excited about that rest series. I hope that you're talking to your friends and, and looking for opportunities to say, why don't you come along? Because I think it's applicable to many of our lives, especially as fall gears up again. But enough of that. Let's, let's get back to today. In our, in our reigning... Matthew is going to actually, our, our reading today is the middle reading of a slew of readings that we have to kind of peel apart. And my challenge today is to cover three big things that I could probably spend a week a piece on, but to do them fast enough that y'all aren't asleep by the time we finish. So we're going to go quickly, right? So grab your Bible. And go to Matthew 14. By the way, we say this around here occasionally, and, and we mean it. If you don't have a Bible, take the Pew Bible with you home. We want you to have God's Word. It's okay. We'll replace it. We'll figure it out. Take it, mark it up, circle it, highlight it, do what you need to do to start processing God's Word. You heard our reading for today started at verse 13. So Matthew chapter 14, that's the first book of the New Testament, about two-thirds of the way through the Bible or so. Matthew chapter 14, beginning with thir verse 13, and it talks about this strange thing where Jesus is hanging out and his disciples want to send the people who have gathered home, and Jesus is like, no, we don't have to send them home. No, they don't need to go to schnooks. We got it covered. And he collects what they want, what they have available, these couple of loaves of fish and apparently a couple of cans of tuna. Um... Which just fascinates me, by the way, that when Mr. Jim says, is this enough to feed us? I wonder how many of your, our children said, I don't like tuna, in their heads. <laughs> just wonder that. The temptation, however, in reading this text, and it's a text that's familiar to many of us. The challenge in reading this text is to somehow think that it's about, you know, we kind of we piggyback with all things with God, all things are possible. We kind of mutate this text to believe that no matter what I'm facing in life, it's going to be okay. 
because Jesus is with me. Jesus is going to make it all work out, and I'm not going to have hardships, and it's all going to flow well. And we kind of fall into this trap of thinking that somehow Jesus makes everything perfect. However, if you noticed, our reading begins with, now when Jesus heard this. Did you catch that? It's not accidental when the gospel writers throw these kind of little transition phrases in because they want you to understand the tie between what they're about to tell you with what they just told you. So let's back up. Because just before this, the now when Jesus heard this, we, we need to ask, what's the this, right? The this, in this case, is Matthew reporting that John the Baptist has just been executed and Jesus has just gotten word of it. So back up for a second with me and let's spend a little bit of time on this. Jesus is hanging out and these people come to him and they say, hey man, John the Baptist, whoop. And Jesus is going to go through a series of emotions as are his disciples. Not only is Jesus related to John the Baptist, but let's be blunt, John the Baptist is like a rock star of the faith. Like if you can think of a superhero in the church in the day that Jesus lived, it's John the Baptist. This would have been the guy in our day publishing books and having blogs and having faces and stuff going on. This, this would be that guy, right? This would be the guy that when you hear, hey, John the Baptist is going to be in town, you all cancel plans and go buy tickets to go to the Show Me Center. That's John the Baptist. This is a big deal. I mean, God is at work through the ministry of John the Baptist. Great things happen when John the Baptist shows up. There is momentum in the room when John the Baptist walks into it, and now we run into this absolute cliff of John the Baptist just got his head lopped off and is no more, and everyone had to be going, what is up, God? What is up? with your plan. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, we thought you were at work like this, and, 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 and now this happened. What? Which leads us to the question of the morning. You heard Mr. Jim talk about it a little bit, and you've seen it in your worship guide, I'm assuming, by now. The question of the morning for all of us to wrestle with is very simple and unbelievably painful if we really want to take it seriously. And it's this. Is Jesus really enough for you? Is Jesus really enough or do we need to stack a whole bunch of other expectations of God on top of this equation? Is it enough, Lord, that I get in a few minutes to come up here and circle around this big slab of whatever stone this is and I get to receive your body and blood? Is that enough, God? Or will I only trust in you if you make the other junk in my life disappear? If suddenly a, I get a phone call this afternoon saying I get a job, a new job, or that, that my spouse or my loved one who's ill suddenly gets healed. Is Jesus enough? Or are there other things that we also think God owes us? We start this little string of three stories with kind of an abrupt redirection of the narrative. So you think God's going to do all this stuff and he requires the John the Baptists and all of these things to work out his plan and suddenly God goes, wham! See you, John the Baptist. And the disciples had to be thinking, God, I don't get this. You're working in ways that don't make any sense to me. I thought we needed John the Baptist. I thought that's what your kingdom was about. He was doing your stuff. He was doing well. He was doing everything that you wanted him to, right, God? Why'd you do this? 
And right on the heels of that kind of questioning God emotion, we roll into this story. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in the boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, you, you heard the reading, right? When Jesus hears this news, this earth-shattering, kingdom-altering news of John the Baptist beheading, he retreats. He's going to take some quiet time. Interestingly, he's going to rest, segue for next weekend. And the crowds are going to flood after him, and Jesus is now going to go out and do ministry with them, and the disciples are going to do ministry with them, and it's going to become evening, and it's going to dawn on everyone that as Matthew records, they're in a desolate place. Did you catch that? They're in a desolate place. There's nothing. There's dust. There's dirt. It's abandoned. And they come to Jesus in this desolation, not only physical desolation, but I believe spiritual desolation after the events of John the Baptist beheading, and they say, Jesus, we got nothing. We're dry. Send these people away so we, can, so we can get on with this. Send them away so they can be cared for because we can't do it, Jesus. And Jesus says, yes, you can. What have you got? And they bring forth their fish and their loaves, and Jesus uses it to do something spectacular. There's three sermons automatically that I could preach to you about this text alone. Everything from note in the reading, these are just little nuggets for you Bible scholars, note in the reading that while it's a desolate place, Jesus makes them sit down in the green grass. That's not accidental that Matthew is going to parallel these two images of desolation and abundant greenery in the presence of Jesus. But in the midst of the railing, Jesus is going to show his disciples, hold on a second, we don't need John the Baptist and we don't need schnooks because I'm here. And in fact, I am enough. We then move on to the third of these three little stories and I want you to understand that they are linked together on purpose we know that because the following verse, verse 22, begins with this. Immediately, see that's a transition word, that means right after this just happened, immediately the next thing is that Jesus is going to send out his disciples. He's finished feeding them. They've picked up these basketfuls. He sends out his disciples and he says, all right, I've got to take care of the crowds. You guys don't worry about it. You go ahead on the boat. I know you're tired. You go out on the boat. I'm going to take care of things. And he closes up shop. He sends everyone home with their big full bellies. They're content. They've just had something awesome happen, even though they have no idea that it just went down. Jesus is going to deal with them, disperse them, and then he's going to realize, oh, the boat's way out there. And it's being rocked, and Jesus is going to have this moment that we've all seen pictures of or heard stories of where he goes trudging out on the water, and there's this interaction with Peter where Peter kind of messes stuff up and gets it right and then messes it up. Jesus walks on water, and Peter does briefly. And yet again, we mutate that story into something that it's not, because see, here's the way the narrative goes together. Crud happens. Is that too clean of language or not clean enough for some of you? Junk happens, right? Our plans about how God is going to work often get terribly terribly derailed. Junk happens in life. And God in that moment is not forsaking you. He wants you to wrestle with this question, am I enough for you, Mark Martin, with the junk you're going through? Am I enough, Blair? Am I enough, John? Am I enough for you? And then he's going to pull back and he's going to demonstrate that in fact, with him, he is enough. Please hear me. That is not about God's material blessing. This story of loaves and fish is not about, oh, awesome, with God, I can go buy a big plasma TV because God's going to cover the payment. It's not about somehow God blesses me materially. It's about God saying to you, in relationship with me, you don't need to worry. I've got you covered. And then part three of this narrative is Jesus demonstrating that. 
It's Jesus demonstrating not only does he have Peter covered, but he has us covered because Jesus is not just some dude like you and me. Jesus is the son of the living God who commands the waves and the laws of nature. He is God. And he's enough. What's fun about this text and simultaneously kind of butt-kickingly painful about this text that I encourage you to journey with me into this process is it, it draws us in to wrestle with, do I live that way? Or is that just cool church talk? Do you know what I mean? Do I live like Jesus is enough or is that just stuff that I kick out on Sunday morning when I got my fancy clothes on and I got my donut and I'm shaking hands with people and I got my fake smile on? Do we live like Jesus is enough? My family and I just vacationed to Branson a week or so ago. We took a couple days and ran down to Branson. Um, I got to expose my son to the world of roller coasters. Awesome. And he liked them even better. But as we're getting ready to leave town last Friday morning, a week and a, 10 days ago or so, my kids, they're going to kill me for telling you all this about them. But, but in my family, the, the peak of eating breakfast out is going to McDonald's for breakfast. I mean, that, that is like God has, has given us all things when we get bacon, egg, and cheese biscuits in the morning. And so we decided, you know, our last morning, we're going to go to, to McDonald's for breakfast. And we went, and we were eating and hanging out, and the place was crazy packed. And then I noticed, kind of in a strange way, but that's another story, this family behind me, this couple behind me who didn't have any food on their table. And they had their backpacks, and you can envision this scene. And they smelled a little. And they were frantically, they had like 67 things plugged into one wall charger. And one of them was on the phone talking to someone. And they were clearly kind of anxious. And so we, we finished our bacon, egg, and cheese biscuits and our drinks and our hash browns and, and all that stuff. And refilled our drinks because that's kind of how we roll in our family. And we were walking out and I said, Jill, I need to talk to these people. I, I mean, I just have to. I just have to go talk to them. And she gave me the beautiful, spectacular, loving spouse reaction that all of you awesome, spectacular wives, when your husband's about to do something slightly nuts, she kind of gave me the, oh, oh, okay, honey. <laughs> and so I said, you take the kids out to the car. I'm going to do this. And long story made short, I talked to them, and they were, in fact, homeless, and they didn't have anywhere to go, and they didn't know what to do, but their primary concern was that they wanted transportation to the area hospital where one of their friends was. And they couldn't get there. If you're familiar with Branson, the hospital's kind of on the other side of the strip, which is where we were. And they couldn't get there. And they said, could you just give us a ride? And, and being the spectacular model of Christian integrity for you that I am, I put them in the car and I Actually, I didn't do any of that. I made an excuse and I got out of there because I knew that my wife and to some degree me were going to freak out a little bit because our van was packed and we had our two small children in there and it was unsafe to put these two strange people in our van. Right? That would have been kind of crazy. By the way, from Branson to Mountain View, Jill and I argued with God and with each other and felt immense guilt about the fact that we should have helped. Because what dawned on me later, and I'm admitting to you that I didn't respond properly in the moment, but what dawned on me later is that I valued personal safety for me and for my kids over being compassionate and aggressive and loving for the sake of Jesus. In other words, in that moment when faced with the question, is Jesus enough, I answered, nope. I need to be safe, too. God, nope, you're not enough. 
You didn't tell me to be safe, but I want to be safe. I want to take care of my family. I mean, you did take, tell me to take care of my family. See, this was the argument in the van. You did tell me to take care of my family, but at the same time, you also told me to love people in your name. And so which one was I supposed to value in that moment? Was I supposed to protect my kids in the van, or was I supposed to love people in your name? And I chose the latter, and I was convicted. I mean, I was a wreck, ass Jill. I was a mess driving home. It's not easy to wrestle this question. But what I want to tell you and what I take solace in is Jesus is enough. Yeah, we don't act like it all the time. I don't act like it all the time. I'm sure you don't act like it all the time. Pastor Mark does, but he is the exception. (laughs) We don't act like it all the time, but he is. God says, just hang out with me. I'm the son of God. I got this. I've given you a new identity in me. We don't need to wrestle these questions. We can just live in the security of my grace because I am enough. Last thing I promise. I I don't know what junk you brought in here today. I really don't. Some of you I do. Some of you I don't. But I know this, in a couple of moments, you're going to get to stand up here and you're going to receive the very presence of God. And whatever junk you brought in, whatever your Branson McDonald's story is that you're processing right now in your head and thinking, oh, crud, I didn't do well there either. Just bring it up here and realize that in this exchange, you receive tasteable, touchable, tangible forgiveness. You experience the grace of God, and you are again confronted with the reality that he is enough. And then after worship, so I want you to focus on that during communion, and then after worship, I want you to explode out of here. Does that make sense? And when you next time run into that person at McDonald's, or that situation, or that thing where you're torn between loving people in the name of Jesus and security, or loving people in the name of Jesus generously, or financial stability, or whatever that case is, man, dive off the deep end. I will. Or I'll try to. And I encourage you to do likewise. Cool? Yeah? You all awake? You sure? Let's pray. God, you are good, you are holy, and you are enough. Lord, even though we fail and falter and mess up and our lives are full of junk and we don't have anything at all put together, you're still enough. God, remind us that we are your kids, that you love us, that you have plans for us, and whether we fail or whether we flourish, you are enough. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.